end of the Soviet Union was a catastrophe for the international communist movement. The enemies and renegades of socialism, imperialists and reactionaries were waiting with bated breath for the DPRK, as well as Cuba for that matter, to follow the same course and disappear. It's well known that the DPRK lost around 70% of its trade overnight, beginning the infamous era in Korea's history known as the arduous march. The reformists and renegades of socialism who introduced the multi-party system and left the working class party in tatters provided a vital lesson to the Workers' Party of Korea of the necessity of tightening the party's strength. Kim Jong-il put in a lot of work around this time at developing and elucidating the strength of the party leadership. In general, he summed up that building up the role of the party leadership is decisive in developing the motive force of the revolution. The masses and the party must be bound tightly together. If the party's leadership is damaged, then it will lose its position and collapse. If you would like more information about the Juche viewpoint of the Communist Party, then please comment below and let us know. Furthermore, thanks to the economic difficulties brought on by the collapse of the Socialist bloc, fulfilling the objectives of the Sixth Party Congress would prove to be a challenge. At the 21st plenary meeting of the Sixth Party Central Committee, Kim Il-sung recognised a certain necessity of a period of adjustment. The agriculture first, light industry first, trade first policy was adopted in order to wade the tides of the economic downturn. Kim Jong-il threw himself into the task of implementing these policies and assuring that all of the party officials were well endowed with the new revolutionary strategy. During the 1990s, Kim Jong-il also published a number of treaties and essays regarding the collapse of socialism and how the WPK had managed to maintain its position despite unfavourable economic issues. These works included, but are not limited to, Socialism as a Science, Fundamentals of Revolutionary Party Building, Abuses of Socialism Are Intolerable, and so on. In July 1994, Kim Il-sung died. Kim Jong-il not only grieved at the loss of his own father and the immortal leader of the nation, but as well as having to face the prospect of leading Korea without him. Kim Jong-il went about preparing for the funeral of the great leader. He visited many times Mansu Hill, where Kim Il-sung's bronze statue is located. He oversaw the creation of the now official portrait of the president. Kim Jong-il also oversaw the building of the Kum Suzanne Palace of the Sun, the immortal temple of Juche, as the final resting place of Kim Il-sung. Furthermore, he emphasized greatly the need to carry forward the eternal president's ideals as a revolutionary and communist thinker. In 1997, the Central Committee and the Central Military Commission of the Workers' Party chose Kim Jong-il to become the new General Secretary. In 1998, the Supreme People's Assembly elected him to the position of Chairman of the National Defence Commission. After Kim Il-sung's death, 
it was general, generally believed that Kim Jong-il would be elected president of the republic. However, with the introduction of the Kim Il-sung constitution in 1998, the position was formally abolished, awarding Kim Il-sung the ceremonial title of eternal president. During the arduous march, the new general secretary put himself at the forefront of the struggle for defending the republic from the imperialists and waging the struggle in the face of economic blockade and natural disasters. Kim Jong-il spent many hours on his personal train travelling all over the country. He, like he and his father always had done, visited farms, factories and mines, listening to the grievances of the local workers as well as providing on-the-spot instruction. In a speech titled, Officials Must Live in the Spirit of the Arduous March, he called for the need of the officials to showcase revolutionary optimism in the gruelling times. On a side note, Kim Jong-il led by example. He emphasised the need in many of his works to develop the driving force of the revolution, a core tenet of the Juche idea. The arduous march was a time of severe economic difficulty for the DPRK. However, his actions have proved the validity of the Juche idea. Ensuring the motive force of the revolution was as strong as ever, the Korean communists were able to reject the false promises of the imperialists of a bourgeois capitalist society. The people, despite the grim outlook, showed steely-faced determination to keep the red flag flying in people's career. Let us learn from Kim Jong-il's good example. In the early 2000s, Kim Jong-il spent a great deal of time developing Korea's relationship with Russia, China and a number of other countries. In 2001, he paid a visit to Moscow where he laid a wreath at Lenin's mausoleum and paid profound respect to him as well as the Soviets who fought gallantly for the liberation of Korea and the working people of the world. Kim Jong-il explained in depth the necessity to fight fire with fire in the showdown with the imperialists. During the six-party talks between North and South Korea, Russia, China, Japan and the US, the US and the Bush's administration took the approach of not listening to a word of the Koreans' demands until they completely dismantled their nuclear weapons program. Kim Jong-il time and time again stressed the importance of standing up to the American bullies. The Americans were eventually forced to sit up and take proper notice of the DPRK and listen to their demands. The US DPRK conference in Berlin in 2007 took place. The DPRK presented the US with a list of demands, including scrubbing the DPRK from the list of state sponsors of terrorism as well as unfreezing their foreign assets. In 2008, a number of these demands were met, the Bush administration's hardline tactics had failed, and in the end, they had to go to the DPRK on bended knee and attempt a policy of dialogue. By the end of 2008, the US delivered 160,000 tonnes of grain, 200,000 tonnes of oil, and enforce the obligation of economic compensation by other foreign countries to deliver 500,000 tonnes of oil, amounting to around $300 million. Under Kim Jong-il's leadership, the DPRK took a hardline approach to the hardliner USA. Kim Jong-il knew that the imperialists only knew one language, and that a tough approach was necessary in securing peace. Under Kim Jong-il's leadership, Korea sent a clear message to the imperialists that destroying the DPR of Korea would not be an easy task and that they would have no choice but to listen to him. Kim Jong-il unfortunately died in 2011 while on his way to perform field guidance. Kim Jong-il died doing his most humblest of actions, serving the people. He was, in my opinion, a shining example of the true communist spirit. 
He was a fierce military commander, diplomat, theoretician and practical party leader. He displayed a deep calmness and profound understanding of the philosophical and practical problems which lay ahead. From his early days to his very last, he proved himself to be a noble man with abundant virtue. We must never forget Kim Jong-il. He was, in my opinion, the greatest communist of the 20th century. Many came before him, and many will come after. However, his lifetime of work will go down in the history books of the progressive people in the world as the most determined, humble, and logical leader of the Korean, no, the world proletariat. To finish, I would like to quote a passage from my favourite work of his, Socialism is a Science. Quote, In order to sincerely serve the people, one must first think of the people before oneself and regard the pleasure and pain of the people as one's own. Local service to the people is a communist's sacred duty. Herein lies the value of communist's life. A man who works for the revolution enters the working class party not for his self-interest, fame or authority, but to serve the people more faithfully. Those who undergo hardship before anybody else and put it before pleasure, and who take charge of difficult tasks on their own while giving credit for success to others, they are the true communists and members of the working class party.